Before we get started, make sure you subscribe to this channel. That way, when I release more videos like this, you'll get notified. So welcome to the show, Mark. So excited to have you here. So before we get Thanks, started, um, tell us a little bit about like who you are, what you do, and then we'll just jump into the conversation. Sure. Uh, well, it's great to see you again, Betsy. It's been uh, been too long. Uh, right. Mark That's John. Too long. <laughs> um, uh, I um, uh, most recently was the CEO of uh, Concord Servicing. Um, that is a um, loan and receivable servicing company based in uh, Scottsdale, Arizona, uh, with um, operations in Mexico City, Mexico. Uh, been doing that. Uh, for uh, the last three plus years. Prior to that, I was um, the chief hospitality officer for uh, Wyndham. Prior to that, I ran uh, Wyndham's captive finance uh, business. I was the president of Wyndham Consumer Finance. And before that, I was at GE Capital, uh, both as a lawyer and a business person. And uh, I could keep going back, but basically in 35 years or so of uh, public career. I've worked um, uh, at three companies um, since I uh, left the private practice of law, which tells you I'm a recovering lawyer. Um, <laughs> and I don't know if you ever fully recover from that with all due respect to all the lawyers out there, but it, it's a blessing in many regards because it does teach you um, an analytical, logical um, thinking uh, that um, is uh, um, very, very um, beneficial. Uh, but I haven't officially practiced law for probably, I don't know, since uh, probably 20 years. So you spent all of that time going to law school and you became a lawyer. What kind of lawyer were you? Uh, well, I'll tell you, I originally went to law school um, because I was going to save the world. You know, that was kind of my intention. I was going to make the world a better place. And um, uh, I changed my tune um, during the first year of law school and thought, you know, this is a highly competitive, um, highly energized environment uh, where there absolutely are individuals like that. Um, and there, I'll call it um, commitment to that sort of an approach um, exceeded mine in large part because um, I also am very practical by nature and knew I needed to make a living. So um, I went to school at the University of Nebraska, um, clerked at a, at a very good law firm in Lincoln while I was going to school there. When I got out, um, moved to Phoenix, um, started doing a little bit of everything with the firm locally in Phoenix, uh, where the work was, and I'll explain why I liked it in a minute, was really in um, real estate, real estate finance. Uh, the area was and continues to grow. Um, and as a result, uh, there was an abundance of work. It enabled me to really grow up and learn what it was I liked about the practice of law. And what I liked about the practice of law was figuring out how to get to a win-win arrangement versus a win-lose arrangement. You can find that in probably any uh, profession. Um, but for me, uh, real estate finance generally resulted in more of a win-win um, than did um, you know, courtroom work. So I gravitated towards that the real estate finance law, which, which uh, led me into um, a corporate environment, long story behind that, but the corporate environment enabled me to continue doing win-win work, um, working with a group of people um, as their counsel. Um, the practice I had grew from a, a local one in the, in the metropolitan Phoenix area to a um, national one, even to some degree an international one doing finance related stuff. Did that for a few years, had an opportunity to go run a small line of business for that organization, um, did that, and then uh, uh, left that organization when um, it got a little big for um, what worked well for it. 
uh, and ended up going to work for GE Capital. From GE Capital, uh, ended up at a company called Wyndham and uh, left Wyndham in 2018 or 19, ended up at Concord and have worked there you know, right up until this week. So I'm so interested in this win-win philosophy. So I didn't know that about you. So I remember meeting you when we were leading that reorganization project. So you were one of the key stakeholders and key champions of the project. But I remember a big part of what you brought to the table was this analytical side and you were always talking about the strategic side of the business, but I didn't really see this win-win. Can you talk a little bit about like your leadership philosophy and would you say it was influenced by your legal um, experience or would you say you've always had this philosophy and just that's the part that you gravitated to? Like, have you always been this win-win kind of guy? Um, always is a long time. Uh, I would say, you know, you find your style and you find what works. And what I realized works for me is much more of a win-win. Um, and that's what I gravitated towards in, in my work and frankly, in my relationships. Um, so, uh, you know, the legal background is extremely helpful because it does te teach you to be, you know, uh, analytical, logical, reasonable, uh, reasonable a uh, well-reasoned, you know, you're, 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 you're learning as much a way to think as what to think. Mm. Um, cool. And, and I'm, you know, forever indebted for that. Um, and, you know, as a 24 year old young pup coming out of law school, um, you know, I figured um, I'll find my way and, and where it kind of led me to was utilizing maybe some analytical skills that were much more inherent in me um, and meshing it with kind of the win-win um, and social elements that, that I found appealing for me being a relationship-based individual. Sorry. That's okay. So when you were leading, so when we were in that project together, I remember there was one part of it when we talked about the culture change, remember we had like the two mountains of like, what got you here isn't going to get you there. Right. And what's your BHAG? I remember you. Uh, yeah. What's your BHAG? <laughs> there was stuff on the mountain where it was like being systemic and systematic or, or strategic. I thought you were resonating towards the strategic side. It sounds like you were resonating towards like a company needing to be more system systems oriented. Um, am I hearing that right? Is that that's a big part of kind of like the way you thought about change or how organizations should be? I, I think it's both. Um, frankly, you know, strategy is is critical. Um, I remember that 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 project very very well, and you know, strategy was at the core of that. Um, uh, I, I think strategy uh, underlies everything that you do, and if you if you lose on strategy or culture, or it's not a good fit, um, that's problematic. And I think organizations grow and mature uh, from maybe processes that have worked for them in the past to processes that support strategy. Um, and I think, in my opinion, a lot of companies today put strategy and culture at the forefront, and then they design their processes um, around that that philosophy or strategy you know and, and you can you can call it you know being purpose driven um you know I, I love it that that young people going to work really into the professional environment for the first time today or just just going to work you know on a full-time basis today they're they're much more purpose driven um and focused on you know am I making a difference and the um, companies that are appealing to those folks uh, have that that purpose ingrained in their strategy. So long way of saying, I, I think you need the process uh, rigor. You need um, logistics. You need um, a pattern and a plan. Um, you need great analytics uh, to support success 
in uh, things that are driving your strategy. You know, I, I guess for me, uh, going back from when we were first working together, um, it wasn't a, you know, you're gonna you're gonna succeed in one area or another when it came to taking care of the customer, taking care of the associate, and taking care of the financials. If you were gonna succeed in a business, you had to do all three. Um, and and that to me is win, win, win. And you find people who balance and uh, support each of those differently in putting together a team that that um, supports a strategy to win on all three of those elements, the customer, um, the, the associate, and the financial front. So all of this comes together is that a strategy for it to be a strategy has to satisfy the customer, the associate, and the bottom line. All three of them have to be together and you have to look at all of them. So that's where strategy and system come together with your win-win philosophy. That That is my view of the world in a so, nutshell. Okay. So then when you went from real estate finance law into real estate finance leadership, like how did you, did you go straight into the law part and then you got immediately promoted into leading the unit? And when you, or were you leading only lawyers or were you leading other kinds of people? Like how does that influence your, your career trajectory, if you will? Yeah, I started, I started leading um, a legal team in a corporate environment. Um, and I guess the analytical side uh, served me very well, well in working with a group of um, relatively large group of individuals in a business who were very, very um, analytical, a lot of accounting, um, a lot of finance, um, and uh, worked well in representing and helping that group. Uh, that was really the bridge um, when um, the individual that, that led uh, that organization at the time said, you know, hey, Mark, will you come uh, and run this group who was previously run by a very talented gal who became um, the organization's CIO. She was a CPA by background. Um, and um, it was it was scary because it was a leap, but I had to trust like, what do I like doing? And you know what I discovered about myself was, um, you know, I liked leading that group of people and working with that group of people towards a common cause that worked for our customers, worked for the organization and worked for them better than I liked representing them from a legal perspective. And you know, that individual that gave me that opportunity recognized that you know, I'll be forever indebted for them. Um, again, not bashing the legal practice, you know, who knows, I, I could do that again someday. Um, uh, but for, uh, you know, for a career tra trajectory, it really was about, I'll call it trusting my, whether you call it heart, sense of, you know, what I liked and where I was good and where I got the most um, um, joy. It was really following that. And, and that individual that gave me that opportunity um, you know, as a friend of mine to this day. Uh, and what I discovered is the, the line between the two isn't, isn't so hard and fast. You know, you can apply analytics, legal reasoning to leadership, um, all day long. Um, and over time, as I've, as I've gotten older, uh, I think I've been the, the, beneficiary of a little bit of both. So it's interesting is that a lot of times when I work with clients who are leaving corporate and they start their own business, a lot of times like they have their formal job or whatever they had on the org chart, and then they develop this other expertise on the side. And then when they want to start their business, it's really this other expertise, like they mentored other people or they were learning something else. And that's what they want to build a business on. And it sounds like that same thing happened for you is, all right, so here's the formal expertise that I have around real estate finance law. 
But over here, as I'm developing a leadership, a unique leadership competency, if you will, that is based on the philosophy of balancing out for the customer, for the associate, and for the bottom line. And this is the philosophy. And when you have the opportunity, it's like, hey, wait a minute. I'm trusting that I actually did develop this other expertise, and now I could use this to branch out into new leadership opportunities that are detached from my formal area of expertise that I spent years developing and that you could branch into other areas. Yes, spot on accurate. Okay. You know, thank you. And, and uh, you know, just very, very fortunate that I had the opportunity to do that within, um, I'll call it corporate environments, because um, while it's risky leaving a, leaving a chosen profession, law, and, and doing something different. You know, I was in a safe place um, to do that. Um, and, you know, the, the um, entrepreneurial spirit that folks such as yourself demonstrate, you know, that, that takes a lot of guts um, and a lot of intestinal fortitude that, you know, when I made that leap, um, Frankly, I lacked the maturity to do on my own. And I was given that opportunity in a corporate environment um, that enabled me to grow, nurture, and develop it. So I consider myself very, very fortunate and you know, have done my darndest not to um, bypass learning opportunities you know, that come my way. Uh, I think folks who have the courage to act on that entrepreneurial spirit to really trust their gut um, are just just hugely inspirational. So kudos to you and your compadres who've done that. Well, thank you for saying that, but let's not diminish the what you had to go through because I think it tr- brings up that same sort of like imposter syndrome. It's like, I know law, but do I know how to do this leadership? And then you went into from a senior, senior VP role into in president of the subset into the the chief hospitality officer role, which is a much bigger span of control mm-hmm. in a very different area, 100% detached from the real estate, legal finance area that you went into. <laughs> so let's not diminish that, that you yeah. overcame that. So um, I wanted, I do want to go back into like, what, what, is there any advice that you would give to someone to say, I can detach from my functional area of expertise and I could just grab a hold, whether it's as a consultant or coach or as an executive, is I'm going to let go of my functional identity and I'm going to grab a hold of this other new label. And for you, it was an executive leader, which is very different than a real estate finance lawyer or leader of real estate finance law people. So what would, yeah, what me, what tips would you give on how what yeah, helped you? The the bridge for me um, really was kind of identifying core competencies that that spanned across the function. Oh, um, so I did have you know a lot of um, uh, I'll call it moments of doubt or people who would be like well. You've been a leader in finance, but you know how are you going to run? You know how are you going to lead eight thousand people across two hundred and fifty resorts? And you know I had to look to all right, what are the commonalities that um, individuals, some of whom you know, saw in me that could be the bridge? Um, and really, for me, that was. Um, finding a uh, um, a purpose that would enable me to bring that win-win philosophy um, from one group to another. Um, and and you know if you surround yourself with people who are, I'll just say better than you at their skills and and they will follow you, um, you know the world's your oyster. And I've been very, very fortunate, um, thank, thankfully, that that's occurred. You know, some would say, "Well, it's very easy to find people better than you," but you know, uh, when you uh, you when you surround yourself with people 
um, who are really good at their jobs and, and believe in what you're trying to accomplish. Um, and you can unite them around um, principles that to me are focused again on those three things, customer, associate, and financials. Um, it, it's, it's, there's a common, a common drive, a common purpose uh, that, you know, you can, you can draw upon when things get tough. And I think that to me goes back to your comment about strategy. Um, it, you know, you, you used to term, use the term, Nancy, when we're, or sorry, you used to use that term when it was, there were five of us uh, who were doing that. And you would remind us, what's your North Star? You know, what's your, what's your BHAG? You know, what are you focused on? And I think if you, if you can, if you can draw alignment on that common purpose, like you did for the group of us, um, you can, you can accomplish a lot. And, and I think that, um, for me has been just identifying and finding, you know, what do I believe in, in a person and, you know, what are the skills that I can bring to a situation and how do they best translate into this group? And, you know, when they do, it's a powerful thing. So, okay, this is so fascinating. I wish I would have known this backstory when I met you because now <laughs> there's, there. I understand that your transition into the hospitality officer role was a much bigger transition than I realized. And now that as we're talking it through, like, okay, most of my experience when I work with operations, they tend to be the warrior, fire, fire, fire kind of people. You know, so I'm sure the people who went before you were fire, 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 and you're definitely a ready, aim, fire type of person. You know, you got more Absolutely. of that sage energy. So how did the operations team respond to such different leadership that you are offering compared to what they must have been used to for years and years and years? Uh, that team that you're referencing um, had good leadership. Um, it was different than my leadership, but again, there were a lot of similarities. And ultimately, um, after a few shifts, uh, they reacted very well to it. Um, but it, it started with, as most things in a relationship-based environment start with, trust. And you know, I needed to gain their trust. Um, you know, that group that you're referencing um, and names and, and visuals running through my head right now, they, um, they were skeptical. You know, they're like, what, what's this guy who's been running a, you know, $4 billion captive finance company know about, you know, renovating a resort, running a resort, um, operating a res center where you've got, you know, you're taking reservations for people, um, dealing with 200 plus HOAs around the country. And, and you know, that there definitely was that. And when they realized that I wasn't there to, you know, take over any sort of functional direction for them, I was there to help guide them strategically and, and put processes in place that, that, um, that followed those strategies. So I'm, I'm a big believer in KPIs, you know, metrics. And, you know, it was always a pleasure for me when um, I would uh, go visit, you know, resorts, leave Florida where I was living at the time and go visit resorts anywhere, anywhere really in, in North America, I could see common KPIs supporting strategies um, that each one of the the general managers at those resorts was was following and tracking and you know expecting their people to do the same. So yeah, I think again, they saw a bridge between, okay, well, there's some analytics here that we like. We can leverage this to help us be better. Um, and we believe in the strategy. So we're gonna we're gonna follow. And eventually the trust built. So do you think it benefited you for not growing up in that? environment like that you had a fresh perspective like a lot of times when you grow up in a functional area and then you become the head of the functional area you know your perspective is a little bit narrow rather than you know having a wider view of the business having that experience in the financial side the real estate side 
Did that benefit you? For me, 110%, it benefited me um, because it, it fit my personality. Um, I'm going to go back to the practice of law. I have friends uh, who have developed and wanted to develop such a narrow area of expertise. I think you could probably do the same thing with respect to medicine, that they are 110% experts in their particular field. And you know they are specialists who get paid a lot of money and provide a lot of benefit because of that specialty. Um, there are definitely individuals who migrate towards that type of an environment. Um, that wasn't me. I was um, much more of a, um, uh, we'll figure it out, kumbaya, you know, let's, let's succeed as a group uh, type of a person. Um, and I, and it, I have a hard time picturing you in a little circle singing kumbaya. Yeah. I, just can't, <laughs> I just can't see you in the hippie clothes. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, with a pocket protector, maybe? I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> That's so funny. Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah I'm sorry. Right. Sorry, Betsy. Um, I, I did have at one point, you know, hair down to here and out to here. Oh, I need you to get me a picture so I can post it in <laughs> yeah. my blog for this. Yeah, please, please. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll um, and, and actually at a, um, a Halloween party in Mexico City a couple of years back, I uh, kind of reverted back to that. I'll send you that picture uh, <laughs> so you can see it. But uh, it was a wig, but that was not far off from the truth for me as, as a kid growing up. I just happened to have, again, an, an, I'll call it um, a natural knack for math numbers, logic, um, that, that, you know, I was very, very comfortable with. So then you left that organization and you went to a higher role. So you went, moved into the ultimate role as a CEO. Um, what was that transition like? And were you just still drawing on the same leadership philosophy, leveraging your, your analytical logic gifts and your philosophy around balance for the customer, for the associate and for the bottom line. And that all aligned to purpose and strategy. Did you just take those principles and apply it or did you add something new to your toolkit, your leadership toolkit? Uh, yes and yes. So I absolutely took those um, philosophies and applied them. The um, organizations that I had worked for since the time I left the private practice of law were publicly traded. So um, going from a publicly traded organization where there is absolutely a focus on quarterly earnings, which makes that, you know, that, that you know, hey, meet or exceed your financial commitments component of that three-legged stool, very, very critical. Um, the company that um, uh, I was, you know, the new CEO of uh, had been, uh, it was a founder led organization and it startled a lot of the workforce when he stepped aside as CEO, brought me in as CEO and he took a chairman of the board um, role. That said, his influence um, was and is considerable on that organization having you know having founded it and run it for you know 30 years um i think i was telling you early you know betsy that it was like it, it was a child you know it was his child and he was entrusting me to his child um and this gentleman um definitely paid attention to the bottom line um not nearly to the degree that a publicly traded company would. Um, this individual um, actually enabled the workforce to maybe focus more on really the customer component of those three legs of the stool, certainly then on the financial side. And then he took it upon himself to make sure that 
he he cared for people that worked for him. You know, he he valued loyalty to a great degree, and a lot of the individuals that that you know work for that organization to this day have been there twenty five plus years. Uh, wow. You know, so um, the difference in the organizations had more to do with it being a publicly traded company where there's a, a significant quarterly focus on earnings and cash flows to a privately held organization where really a lot of people didn't understand the internal finances other than the founder and his family and me. Um, that was probably the biggest transition. Um, there definitely was a commonality in, you know, care for the workforce, uh, care for the customer for sure. And I probably brought, I know I brought rigor um, that that gentleman really appreciated around the financial processes of budgeting um, and uh, pushing accountability for hitting numbers down through the organization off of entirely his shoulders or my shoulders. So a little bit of both. I know that's a long-winded answer, but a little bit of both in um, you know, utilizing kind of that win-win philosophy um, in an environment where um, I could take a knack for focusing on financials, bring it to that organization, which by the way, um, uh, has experienced three successive years and it will again this year of double digits earnings growth. Um, so, you know, it, it's, it's been, um, it's, it's been uh, very, very su successful and it enabled that founder to actually um, sell his business uh, recently um, uh, and, and give him uh, uh, a successful retirement, even though he's still uh, on the board of that organization. What I love about your philosophy around creating the balance of wherever you go is it just seems like wherever you go, whatever the thing is that's not in balance, you just focus on. So if you're working in an organization that's too much focus on the bottom line, then it's like, well, we need to focus on the customer or the people. And in this scenario, you had a company that you're still going for the balance. They had two out of the three ain't bad, but to get to his goals, you know, again, the North Star, his goal was an exit you just seems like you just brought in that rigor around I'm still bringing the balance. Cause it's not like you were saying we don't need to focus on the customer. We don't need to focus on the employee. We just need to add focus here and we can focus on all three. Doesn't mean that we have to have this piece of pie that's scarce and that we just focus on one small part. We can focus on all of them and they all get better. Couldn't agree more. Um, you know, it's all about that balance and trying to win on all fronts um, for me. And um, you know, and uh, a strength can also be a weakness. And, you know, I'll tell a little story here. It's a bit off track, but it'll, you know, I will routinely hear from people who have reported to me that, you know, hey, don't forget to tell me what I'm doing really, really well, because I definitely know from you where I'm falling short. There's a book written years ago about, you know, um, being well, actually, the name of the book is Radical Candor. And um, you know, it's about being very candid with feedback and very direct. Again, from a place of trust, it works. If if you're not, it doesn't. Um, but um I have to remember, you know, that when I am trying to achieve that balance, not to focus so narrowly and so analytically on the opportunity that I lose sight of um, of the positives. And I'm, this is the story I'm going to tell, which, which goes back to um, all the way back to when I was um, dating my wife. We've been married 37 years. Um, but I was dating my wife. And at the time, I was in school uh, in the Midwest. And I played a lot of racquetball, winter sport, indoors. Um, and I got pretty good at it um, and spent a lot of time at it. So she thought while we were dating, hey, I'm going to learn how to play the game. So she learned how to play the game. 
and surprised me for you know a date where we went to a racquetball court and we played. I think racquetball. I know where this is going. <laughs> yeah. So I'm sorry, I'm sorry yeah. to feel empathy for your wife. <laughs> yeah. So she had this one particular very soft serve that she should just she could just not hit. I must have hit that serve to her like 12 times in a row. And all of a sudden I hear the racket drop, her in tears and the door slam behind me. And I turn around and I'm like, what happened? And she's like, I worked so hard, you know, to get decent at this game and you just keep hitting this shot I can't hit. And I'm like, oh, well, I'm trying to help you get better. And she's like, you just pummeled my confidence. I don't even want to be here. So it took me a while to recover from that. I obviously did, but you know, that is a, you know, a tendency to like, okay, you're good over here. You're good over here. You could be better over here. I will hyper-focus on the opportunity area. And that's a weakness that, you know, I've learned and had, you know, for a long, long time. So I'm trying to be sensitive to it, but I will repeat that mistake sometimes. And different people have different tolerances to that. So I need you to talk to my husband because he's wired <laughs> like you. He's a fractional CFO and we're moving to Denver and I've never skied before. And he's like all getting excited to teach me about skiing. And I'm starting to picture the same thing. I'm picturing myself on the skis, having someone like you telling me that. And I'm going to be like, oh, forget it. And I'm going to stop off. <laughs> I need to well, someone okay. else teaching me how to ski. C congratulations. I love Denver. I think it's a phenomenal city. Uh, very, very excited for you. And I would ask you to teach me how to ski, but I don't yeah, know. <laughs> for, no, for whatever it's worth, I would, I would, I'm just kidding. I would advise you to take a lesson. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay. So here's what I love about, about the a whole idea of that balance though, is any strength that can be to an extreme. So the best part about somebody who has this analytical side and the sage side is you can quickly pinpoint where things aren't working but it's like just staying conscious around the balance. And that's why perhaps maybe that's why when you work with other people, like maybe when you hire a consultant or coach that they can bring out the things that would be in your blind spot. So I imagine, I know for when I worked with you as a consultant, we were working on the project team. You were amazing as a client to work with. Why, why would you as an executive hire consultants or coaches? Is it to bring balance for yourself because you believe so much in balance? Yeah, or am I putting well, words in your mouth? Yeah, no, 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 no. Betsy, you're terrific at this, by the way. But, um, you know, you bring really two things um, as a consultant that um, I think are critical um, to any group or organization. Um, the first one is to see things from a more objective perspective, from an outside in view. Um, you immediately did that you know, with us and that organization. You, know, you, you looked at us and said, well, what about this and what about that? And you, know, you caused us to really think a bit deeper about those opportunities because as an organization, you can and often do develop blinders to those opportunities. Um, so uh, as an outside in perspective, there's uh, objectivity and a fresh perspective that sometimes can be lacking on a team or an individual. Um, the second piece of that, um, that that you were very, very good at was building that trust and that rapport to where that objectivity could come out in a non-threatening manner. Whereas if it's somebody from an um, internal position, um, it can be threatening to a workforce. You know, it's like, well, why is Jane Doe over here attacking, you know, me? And, you know, the, the outside in view brings both objectivity and an opportunity to be um, candid without being threatening. Um, even though, 
a lot of the things that you discuss and you discussed with us when you were leading that team, Betsy, was you know threatening to the organization. Um, not in a bad way. It just it it really caused us to look at things differently, and that's a that's a huge win, you know. Um, to me, um, you always hire your weaknesses, you know, and um, I think I've always tried to do that. You bring in people whose strengths aren't necessarily where you're particularly strong. Um, and I've been uh, uh, at leadership positions that are high enough to where I could afford to do that. Um, but that that objectivity that you bring um, and the ability to do it in a non-threatening way uh, is huge. I love that. Thank you so much for the compliment. Um, you know, I'm curious about something is, um, I look, one of the big things I do now, so I don't consult anymore. I am... A mentor to other people, but I predict to particularly focus on the brand messaging and positioning and a lot of the messaging. So I help people figure out like what words should they use in their marketing on their website and all of that, which I love, you know, like I love drawing all of that out. And one of the things that I find for consultants and coaches, they have a really hard time getting out of is talking about their methodology or talking about their credentials. And I'm wondering from your standpoint, like would it be, if I were gonna help somebody put website copy on and they were looking for someone like you, would it be better to say, you know, work with me, I provide a fresh outside perspective, you know, that will allow your team to explore issues in a new way that's non-threatening and that could constructive dialogue can be had versus, you know, I have XYZ certification or I have XYZ methodology you know, would that appeal to you as an executive? Somebody said something more along those lines and really leaned into that outside perspective. Yeah, I, I think it depends on what they're looking for. Um, and if they're looking for one specific thing um, that is, I'll call it narrow in scope, a particular expertise that um, you figuratively, not literally, but you know, that, that if you have that one specific area of expertise and that's what they're looking for, highlight it all day long. Um, you know, in, in my career working with relatively large organizations until most recently, and even then I would say there are more needs than just one. Um, and you know, there may be one that is the driver that gets you in the door. Um, and understanding what that is and really targeting that to get yourself in the door, I think is critical. Um, and sometimes it may be relatively narrow, but you know, that 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 to me comes back to understanding your customer. Um, and as a consultant, you know, what are they looking for? And so, so what about this way? Let me try something else out. So what if they say, you know, like, so you might bring hiring like a, so if you were going to hire somebody, you're good at strategy. So it sounds like you'd be looking for something else that would be a little bit more of a balance. Like maybe everybody gets an agreement on that strategy or buys into your strategy, you might hire someone for that or a different expertise. It, whatever the expertise is, you might say, whatever it is that the client might actually be typing saying, oh, I need an org design person or strategy. But you could say underneath it is, but work with me, here's how I'm different from other consultants or consultants or coaches out there. Other consultants and coaches might just give you like cookie cutter advice, you know, and give you a lot of harsh feedback without developing a relationship, or they might give you, um, they might not be able to have that, you know, they try to give you best practices that work for somebody else, but not for you, you know, work with me. Yes, I'm going to address these technical things, but the unique value that I'm going to bring is I'm going to bring this outside perspective. And this outside perspective is going to create this intangible value that you couldn't get from any other consultant or coach. Yeah. I mean, like I said, I, I've rarely, if ever seen an organization or a group, group of people trying to accomplish tasks who don't have more than one need. There may be more, there may be one particular need that's pressing that, that you can highlight that gets you into the door and helps you build that 
credibility and trust. Um, but um, you know, for somebody like you who's very well rounded, um, you know, you can expand that into oh, and by the way, here are you know other benefits in addition to what I can bring relative to that that narrow expertise, which makes it a little different than you know um, a um, you know a, a, say a a knee specialist. Um, a knee surgeon, you know, if you're, if you're going, if you have a specialty in knees, uh, you're probably going to see a lot of people who need knee work. Um, but you know, it's a highly specialized area. Um, if somebody has, you know, an issue with a lung, you're probably going to refer them out. Um, and, you know, I think what gets them in the door from a practice uh, is the need gets the customer in the door is the need. Um, but you know, do you have connections? Do you have things to offer the customer that differentiate you that also help you, whether it's, um, other experts that you can rely upon or other expertise, um, that are part of the package you bring that expands your offering beyond the immediate need. So do you know how I did that though? Because I didn't do it because I had this like extra thing that I upsold people on. Do you, <laughs> do you know, you want to know how that happened? Sure. So the, sure first order up, <laughs> so the first order up for bids for all of my consulting assignments is doing an assessment and I begin with a stakeholder assessment. So I met with all the SLT members and found out their stake in the project of, that we were working on, which is an org design at the time. So I figured out where everybody was at and then I figured out from them when I asked them like, hey, we're going to go to the next level down and we analyze like who's the influencers, who needs to be involved, who should get a one on one and who didn't. And then I interviewed all the almost a good portion of the direct reports to the SLT. And I you were one that. of them. I remember so I, that. <laughs> so I interviewed all of you and then I got all of that together. And then we did the research project where I went out to all of the sites or not all the sites. I wish that would have been fun. I would have never <laughs> been done, but you know, I had a chance to go to Vegas and mm -hmm. I got to go to Branson and I got to go to Williamsburg. I got to go to all the different places. I talked to a hundred different employees. I mean, a hundred different uh, uh, customers. And then I don't even remember how many employees. And I had all this data in my head. So when I'm giving an outside perspective, I'm not giving, I'm giving an outside perspective, but it's grounded in what everybody's saying. So I have a similar philosophy. I grew up at Disney. Mm -hmm. So in my world, it's always around guest cast business results is way that we've talked about our three legged to goal. So that's what I would have in mind. So when I put stuff together and I triangulate everything and I present it to the SLT or I present it, I remembered what every single person would say. So I knew I kind of had to remember, I remember from your stake in that project is that there was something on that mountain that was really important to you. And I think it was moving from the opportunistic entrepreneurial kind of um, innovative kind of thing to this innovative more, to more of an innovative strategic systemic, like that was your priority. But other people on your team had a different priority. So then when we're doing the report out, so when I initially had the report out, we knew that some of the feedback was going to be really, really overwhelming. So, and actually Sarah was on the, um, on my podcast last week. So Love you can, yeah. if anybody wants to hear the other side of the project, so <laughs> then Sarah and I decided, so how I contract was for the value of like, what are we going to do? And so we were originally going to just um, give the feedback on the report that was very threatening to the organization. And we knew it, but we used our savvy and we met with every team member individually before we brought them together. So we did. So there's all of this, like, you know, it's not like you just show up with this outside perspective. You have to earn your outside perspective by getting the data you know, and getting the information and hearing and really listening to what people say. I think sometimes consultants and coaches, we listen enough until it sort of like tickles whatever our area of expertise is. And then we go after that one rather than I want to listen for what the root cause is. And the root cause wasn't what they thought it was. It was what you were pointing out, that right. the company culture was still operating like they were, a, you know, a small startup company when they'd grown to this size. That was the root cause. And that was a really hard transition. And that's what you were pointing out. So that's how it wound up. So it's not yeah, like you yeah. just magically come with all this expertise. Right. And I you do know, have the expertise I hired out for it. Yeah, you know, what, what's great about that is you you held a mirror to the organization. Um, 
and and you, you know you basically um, created a mirror based on data that you were able to pull. And again, sometimes without that outside in perspective, you miss that, you know, mm -hmm. um, you know, and that mirror is very, very helpful. I'm a, I'm a big believer in whether it's um, NPS uh, surveys or customer satisfaction surveys, um, uh, associate opinion or engagement um, polls. Um, I'm a big believer in, in gathering that data because in my experience, when you have an objective source doing that, you get a truer picture than when you know you yourself, and you know, I've seen this where organizations are like, well, we sent a survey out and this is what our employees told us. And then you go get an outside survey done and it doesn't look anything at all like that. And, you know, the organization, you know, kudos to Sarah, who you called out my name there, you know, had the guts to give you the opportunity to go gather that data that, that really held up a very true mirror um, to the organization. Um, and, it, and, and it was persuasive, you know, we can talk about that um, another time perhaps, but, you know, uh, that was something that that organization um, needed and frankly wanted to hear, um, didn't quite know how to go about it. And that was, you know, part of our job is, well, what do we do next? And, you know, ultimately, um, you know, that is what you're talking about is being in a, in a place where you can bring objectivity and trust uh, it's where folks will listen to you to hold up that mirror and say, I can help you here. Um, that is an area, but you know, your, your BHAG, your big, hairy, audacious goal, as you called it, um, may, may look a little different than what you think. That's so true. And it's like, it's staying flexible. I think that the, I think for me is like, if I wish that every consultant as we're talking about it, like there's a, there's a couple of things that pop out that it's like every consultant or coach, it's like, I wish you would go into the organization and look at it as a system and kind of have that balance that you're talking about, where it's like, it's the, the customer, it's the associate and it's the business result, but then also looking at your strategy, your processes and your, you know, and your people practices, like how all of those align and be looking for that. And then I think the other thing that I think you and I aligned on it, well, now I know why we got along so well, um, because our <laughs> philosophies are, are so much aligned is, I, I, I think it's like when people talk to you, really listen to them. Like, I still remember the focus group that I did with your people when we were in Vegas. One of your employees was so funny. I don't, you probably would remember if I said her name, if I said her comment, but she made something, some sort of comment because she was upset about something with technology or something. It's like, well, how many pieces of duct tape do you need in order to do your job, you know, <laughs> or something along those lines? Like, I still remember her face and I still remember the sass in her comment. You know, and when you let the employees or the customers, like you just, you know, I think as a consultant or as a leader, it seems like that that's what your secret sauce is. Like, let it land on you, you mm -hmm. know, really take it in. And then find the win-win, you know, going back to the original, like the, it, you don't have to choose. You don't have to choose between purpose and profit. You don't have to choose between the business results and making the customer happy and the employee happy. You do that and it gets out of that scarcity mindset. And I think you had a quote about like how to get out of that scarcity mindset or what happens. If, <laughs> yeah, do you, I think you did. Yeah, I I, um, I looked for the quote real quickly before um, before we started the interview, and I I didn't find it, um, you know. But you know, I I, I do believe um, I have a philosophy of abundance versus a philosophy of scarcity, um, and at the end of the day, that's an optimistic view of kind of the world. I think, um, even though I'm trained as a um, at times paid cynic as a lawyer, but um, yeah, I, I, I do believe that um, it was Margaret Mead. It could be wrong on that, but the quote was something around the, the context of, you know, when a community or a group becomes more focused on their own individual needs than the success of 
that community or that group, um, your community is in trouble. Um, yeah, that's that's a uh, uh, I'm paraphrasing it. Hopefully, quasi accurately. Hopefully, somebody will watch this and say, "Hey, knucklehead, it was not Margaret. Me. It was." <laughs> and this is the quote. But yeah, that's that's the gist of it. You know, and to me, it's always been um, about the community, um, and and you know, as a leader, you know, I think generally, you know, leaders are empowered to represent the group and what it's trying to accomplish. So my focus has always been on the group. And the more you can hold a picture up to, this is what your group looks like. Um, you know, and here's how I can help you, the better as a consultant. Awesome. Well, on that note, this was amazing. Um, before we wrap up, is there anything else that you would want to tell me about you know, leadership, your career trajectory, your insights, your lesson learned, or consulting, coaching, anything else. And I just didn't ask you the right question. No, you, you, um, I've always, always enjoyed chatting with you, Betsy. It's been a pleasure. Um, just, you know, thank you for giving me the opportunity to chat with you. Uh, good luck in Denver. And thank you. Uh, yeah, good luck with the skiing. Um, like I said, I love that community and, and uh, please stay in touch. All the best to you and your followers. Mm -hmm.